This video is a re-upload from August 2014 with no content changes. As such, it may not be completely up to date. Any inaccuracies may be explained by its status as a backup. Completely new Gamergate videos will come in the near future. Thank you. Hey guys, Dev here. It's been a fun week, hasn't it? Before I get into the heart of this video, I have a couple short things to say. Here goes. One, as usual, Cam really did a lot of the legwork on this project. But she's had the help of four other people. One wishes to remain anonymous, while the other three are Rogue Star, Peter No One, and Temmit. And a special thanks to Lord Cat, who did a live stream breaking this news. Two, stop fucking harassing people. Aaron made a long-ass Tumblr post recently, and it basically said people supporting Gamergate are just as guilty of harassment as people opposing Gamergate. Listen guys, the sex lives of Zoe Quinn and Nathan Grayson and Maya Kramer and Brandon Boye and anyone else that comes up is only a matter of public interest if their relationship points to some form of collusion or conflict of interest. Otherwise, it's not part of the topic. There's no excuse for death threats, or rape threats, or threats of violence to Zoe or Maya or anybody. Hell, least of all Sarkeesian, because she's barely even connected to this shit. And yes, I know all too well that they've done it to us too. I've seen how the opposing side painted Gamergate with the broad brush of white cishet male, only for not your shield to appear. And I've seen how people opposing Gamergate have desperately tried to prove that not your shield is just some giant elaborate ruse. I've seen how 4chan has tried to do a legitimately good thing for women in the industry, only to be shouted down by the other side with remarks like, nobody cares about your fucking blood money. Hell, Camera Lady herself has been a victim of this. Even beyond getting her Twitter spam reported and suspended, Anthony Birch lamented that there was no real discussion coming out of this about the ethics of infidelity, that no one was interested in really talking to him about the real issues. But when Camera Lady was willing to have that exact discussion, he blocked her. It's no surprise that Cameron Lady considers herself a feminist, but when she disagreed with Brianna Wu on some feminist point of contention, Brianna called Camera a man because obviously a woman would never disagree with her, right? We all know that the core people, the people at the center of the anti-Gamergate crowd, are not interested in equality. They speak the language of equality, they talk about gender and race a whole lot, but they're immediately willing to just completely erase the womanhood, or the ethnicity, or any other lived experience of a minority person that dares to oppose them. To them, minorities are a tool in their toolbox, not actual living, breathing people with their own issues and opinions. But this video isn't really for them. This video is for all of those reasonable-minded people that still oppose Gamergate. To those people who, simply due to the enormity of the discussion, have yet to truly see the evidence I'm about to present. Aaron said, Gamergate will not win by destroying anybody. It will win by being rational, cool-headed, and factual. It will win by converting people. So if you stand with Gamergate, please show this to people who don't. And if you stand against Gamergate, if you're truly interested in equality, if you're an indie dev, or whatever, please watch this video, examine our evidence for yourself, and keep an open mind. 3. I'd like to issue a formal apology to the development team of Crypto the Necrodancer. Slope Oak approached Dave on Reddit in our PC gaming to discuss some of the things said in the Lego Butts video. First off, props to him for having the balls to step up and publicly reply to the video. Ever since that video went up, it's been radio fucking silence from all the parties involved, except a short blurb from Silverstring Media that basically says, we deny everything that's in the video, also please read these articles on how gamers are dead. Slope Oak mentioned a number of factual errors in his post, and Dave said he will make sure they're looked into in time for the next video. While it's true that we made a factual error regarding C418's involvement in Necrodancer, and that Slowpoke has had four games in the IGF since 2006, the other claims are hard to independently verify without being able to talk to anybody else. And no one's talking. Of course, at the same time, there's also no reason to disbelieve what Slowpoke has said on the matter either. Let me quote a part of Dave's Reddit reply. I don't think anybody seriously thinks there's a giant round table where the journalists and indie devs and PR people, all in the cool kids club, sit down and actively plan how to control gaming while shutting out the little guy. I think what's happened is that the current iteration of indie gaming has grown too big to even be considered indie itself. When there was all of a dozen indie people in the world, it didn't matter if they were friends helping each other out. But it's not a dozen anymore. 
It's thousands of people, with real studios now, with actual games getting made and press favors being exchanged and money changing hands and award shows, but it still acts like it's a dozen people. When it's just two people, they're likely friends, and they'll likely help each other out as friends are apt to do. And then it grows into five friends, and then ten friends, and then thousands of people with significant influence all acting like it's still just a clique. Indie gaming has grown up, but indie devs have not. Indie gaming is a real industry now. Indie devs have not yet adapted to the larger responsibilities that come with being in that industry. The severe disconnect we've seen these past three weeks, how gamers want transparency in what's going on regarding relationships between devs and journalists, and now award shows, and how indie devs insist it's just their personal life, proves this to be the case. This passage cuts to the heart of the matter. Ultimately, do I think Crypto the Necrodancer is guilty of anything? No, I don't. And even if they were guilty, it's of something very, very minor. Silverstring is ultimately the party shouldering the majority of the guilt in this specific situation. So I apologize to Slowpoke and to anybody else who worked on Necrodancer. It's a really good game. After seeing how he is publicly willing to respond to criticism, I decided to buy a copy. And I suggest everybody listening to this go buy one too. It is legitimately good. Now, does that mean that the IGF is entirely off the hook, that it's not corrupt or anything? Of course not. And let's discuss how. Dave and Camerlady both have talked with lawyers about the content of this video, and we're required to state the following. In 1971, the US Supreme Court decided in the case, New York Times Co. v. United States 403 US 713, that journalists are allowed to report on the contents of illegally leaked documents, provided that they had nothing to do with the original leaking, and that the contents of the documents are of legitimate public interest. Later cases added a few clauses relating to Homeland Security, but this landmark decision has ultimately become a major cornerstone of the freedom of the press to report on sensitive materials that are a part of public discourse. Back at the very beginning of all this, Phil Fish's company, Polytron, was doxxed. His website was hacked, and all the files stored within were put up to download. Nobody over here supports the doxing or hacking of Phil Fish or anybody else. We do not condone the leaking of Polytron's data. We will not redistribute Polytron's data. We will not tell you where to get Polytron's data. In discussing the legitimate news interest contained within Polytron's data, we will censor all non-relevant information and we will not provide uncensored versions. We have nothing to do with the hacking of Polytron, and we evoke New York Times Co. v. United States 403 US 713 in our legitimate public discussion of the contents of this data. Now then. Polytron was founded in 2008. In 2009, Polytron received loans from a number of people in order to help finance the company and the creation of the game Fez. On page 19 of the loan contract, there's a table showing who invested, how much they invested, and what percentage of profit share and voting rights they got in return for their investment. Only seven of the people are relevant to this discussion. Ron Carmel, creator of 2D Boy. Nathan Vela of Capybara Studios. Aaron Asaskin, I think I can't pronounce the name of App Above, Kelly Santiago of Ouya, that game company, and Indiecade, Jonathan Blow of EGW, Kyle Gabler of 2D Boy, and Matthew Wagner of Flashbang Studios. After their successful funding of Fez, these seven developers went on to form a group called IndieFund, a funding source for independent developers who were looking to encourage the next wave of game developers. We can safely consider Fez to be the beta test of the IndieFund project. In fact, all parties involved seem to consider this to be the case, as a Polytron financial document shows payments being made back to IndieFund for the original loan. That being said, the official IndieFund website does not list Fez under its games funded. Why? Well, to figure that out, we have to examine the events that took place following the initial investment into Polytron. In 2011, the IGF had five members of IndieFund and three members of Polytron's own staff on the finalist panel. That's eight judges. However, before the IGF was to accept submissions for that year, Fez creator Phil Fish had to announce the delay of the game. Had Phil finished Fez on time, his game would have been a shoe-in to win the grand prize at IGF that year. Next year, Fez is entered into the 2012 IGF. Games to be nominated for the 2012 IGF are considered from September through December of 2011, while finalists are examined from January through March of 2012. The finalist judges for the IGF are made public, and are high profiles within gaming. They can be indie developers, big name developers, journalists, whatever the chair of the IGF decides. It's still not known how they're selected. The nominations judges are hundreds of anonymous individuals, 
all the same type of people as the finalist judges. And due to the tip-offs from a number of indie devs and individuals involved in the IGF that have come forward requesting to remain anonymous, we know the following about the IGF judging process. The previous year's public finalist judges commonly return to be anonymous nominations judges the following year. Judges are assigned games to judge, but can also vote on any other game, even games they're not assigned to. For a game to be considered for a finalist position, it needs to have a majority of all votes cast on it to be positive. Additionally, we know from the Rod and Cartridge article that games are assigned eight judges and that those eight are not even required to play the games they've been given. So, let's examine what this all means for Fez. In 2012's IGF, we have eight anonymous nomination judges that have a financial interest in Fez. We know this because those same people were public finalist judges in 2011. Fez is one of the games in the nomination pool. Judges have the power to vote for games that they're not assigned to. Is it possible that eight judges could anonymously ram a game through by pooling their votes? It seems like it. Fez potentially began the IGF 2012 nominations process with a plus eight bias, and there would be no way for anybody to know. And hell, the idea that judges can vote on games that they're not assigned to is already fucked up. Imagine you're an IGF judge, and you have no conflict of interest regarding any of the games. You're scrolling down the list, seeing what catches your eye. Is it so unreasonable an idea that you would naturally gravitate towards games that already have a big name, like Fez? Interestingly enough, the software used by IGF for the anonymous judges was created by Flashbang Studios, the same studio run by Matthew Wagner, who has a financial interest in Polytron Corporation. The IGF's back end was developed by somebody who invested in Fez. And maybe this is all coincidental, but Fez was allowed through the IGF process twice, which created a shitstorm in the community. Remember that? This has only happened one other time. Hazard made it through the IGF in 2011, and again in 2012. But at least they had the right idea to change their name to Antichamber in order to avoid scrutiny. What makes Hazard, aka Antichamber, interesting is that it is also a game funded by IndieFund. And maybe it's important to note that the 2012 IGF finalist judge panel had two people on it also tied to IndieFund and therefore Fez and Antichamber. Andy Schatz, the dev of Monaco, another game funded by IndieFund, and Robin Hunek, an employee of IndieFund founder Kelly Santiago's company. It's also rather suspect that Brandon Boye, whom you all know from the last video, is close friends with both Phil Fish and IndieFund members, as they have all publicly stated multiple times on Twitter. But what's really suspect to me is this timeline of events. IGF 2012 opens. Shortly after the vetting of nominees begins, Phil Fish delays the launch of Fez to April 2012, mere weeks after IGF 2012 is to announce its winners. Fez then wins IGF awards. Why is this suspect? Well, when you inspect the loan agreement from earlier, on page 2, article 6, it states Polytron shall pay the lenders of the share of gross revenues from the Xbox Live Arcade version of games sold prior to the 365th day after that version's release day. Furthermore, Polytron shall pay lenders the share of the gross revenues from the PC version of the game sold prior to the 183rd day after the version's release date. What does this mean? Well, the people who lended money to Phil Fish received the biggest payout the first 365 days Fez is on sale on the XBLA, and the first 183 days Fez is on sale on the PC. And when would you want to release the game to maximize the profits and payouts? Right after your game has won a major award and received tons of great press, of course. Keep in mind, Phil Fish delayed Fez shortly after the vetting of nominees for IGF 2012 began, and he delayed it to launch right after he would later win IGF awards. Is it possible that Phil Fish knew he was going to win IGF 2012 back in September of 2011? Now these are all very interesting questions that the IGF needs to answer. But regarding just how many pies the indie fund people have stuck their fingers into, there's something a lot more sinister than just questions. And that has to do with Indiecade. You all remember Indiecade, right? That organization that gave Zoe Quinn's Depression Quest an award, while two of its chairs were her sexual or romantic partners, Robin Arnott and Maya Kramer? Well, it goes a lot further than that. We intend to show that Indiecade does not value gaming, integrity, or fairness. Only its own wallet. Recall, in 2009, Kelly Santiago invested money in Polytron. This investment gave her voting rights within the company and a percentage of Fez's profits. In 2011, Kelly Santiago became the chair of the awards jury at Indiecade. Interestingly, 2011 was the year in which Fez brought home two awards, Disciplinary Excellence in Story and World Design, and General Excellence by Grand Jury. 
Indicade's own rules state that the jury that selects these awards is made up of a hundred anonymous individuals, but that the jury's awards chair works with each of the jurors to cast their vote. Read it again. Read it again. Kelly Santiago, chair of the IC's awards jury, having a direct financial interest in Fez, works with the jurors judging Fez to determine their vote in a festival that Fez won two awards. She had her hands in every vote cast, and with her having money in Fez, is it any wonder that Fez won? If this is true, and I believe it is, Indicade is guilty of siphoning individual funds through ticket sales and sponsorship money as prize money for Fez's awards, which is then recycled back into the pockets of those investors. Phil Fish gets a fat payday from his pals, who also get a cut due to their loan agreement, and it all comes out of the pockets of the people who attend and sponsor Indicade. Ultimately, IndieFund appears to be guilty of manipulating events at both Indicade and the IGF in order to maximize their profit margins on Fez, to the detriment of all indie developers that enter those events, as well as the gaming public. This collusion between IndieFund, the IGF, and Indicade has lined the pockets of all involved while treating the other indie entrants to their contests with extreme disrespect, as well as everyone who bought Fez, who thought Fez won its awards on merit alone, anyone who wrote an article on Fez, the IGF, or Indiecade, and all gamers anywhere who truly believe that the indie gaming scene would be a safe haven for all the corrupt bullshit that plagues AAA gaming. They have collectively spat in the faces of everyone who look up to them, and I don't mean just by releasing 10 shitty articles all within the course of a day decrying the death of the gamer. If Fez received such preferential treatment thanks to IndieFund, what other games have also gotten a boost? Did other IndieFund-backed games such as Monaco, Antichamber, Dear Esther, and Zoe Quinn's own Framed also receive special treatment in the awards that they won due to their backers' hands in the cookie jar? What other companies does Kelly Santiago have a vested financial interest in? Why aren't any of these interests disclosed to the public, or even the developers that apply to these events? Of the journalists that covered this, how many of them were incentivized by IndieFund to cover these games positively? When Polytron was hacked, nobody really looked too deeply into it. There was a gigantic shitstorm on V and Reddit, a lot of laughs were had, and then it was forgotten. Nobody, including us, really think to look too deeply into it until we discovered the trail of crumbs leading back to the IGF in the last video. People who are currently invested in Gamergate, don't let anybody fool you. This is not about misogyny. We decry misogyny at every turn. This is not a matter of conservative, hateful gamers versus liberal minorities who are oppressed. We're all very liberal over here. We believe in equal rights, in separation of church and state, in the social safety net, all of that stuff. But we also believe in objective journalism, in freedom of the press, in the right of people to know exactly what kind of bullshit corruption is happening in the hobby they are so very passionate about. This is about corruption, nothing else, and don't let anybody say otherwise. People who are currently anti-Gamergate, please rewatch this video. Examine my evidence for yourself. You're being used by a tiny clique of devs and journalists who care nothing for you other than that you're willing to push their narrative for them free of charge. They don't want you to see the side of them presented in this video. They don't want you to examine this evidence. You need proof of this? Look at the indie devs who have been outright excommunicated from the industry for daring to ask questions. Look at Wolf Wozniak who was shouted down for confessing that Zoe Quinn assaulted him. Who's victim blaming now? Who's the true peddler of rape culture? Please, look around you and determine who's really fighting for things like truth and equality. And to those core group of devs and journalists who use the blanket of social justice to shield themselves from criticisms of their corruption, who grab minorities and forcibly shove them in front of the bullets flying at their head. Your time here is limited. Whether it be due to the slow eventual death of your bent-ass websites, or impending legal action against you, which I am entirely willing to cooperate with should anybody view this video and decide to take it on, we won't allow you to ruin our hobby for your own personal game. Gamers are not dead. But with the advent of YouTube personalities, gaming journalism might as well be. Here's a quick addendum for you. Since Lordcat did his stream a couple hours before this was recorded, Matthew from the IGF showed up in the Burgers and Fries channel to try and clear some things up. He was asked a very simple question. Was there conflict of interest regarding Fez's win? It takes him two minutes, and then he says, I haven't really thought about it until this morning. In his visit to Burgers and Fries, Matt confirms three other things. One, Fez was in fact funded by the group that would later become IndieFund. Two, Matt confirms the IGF juror tool 
cannot scan for conflict of interest. Jurors have to recuse themselves on their own. It works on an honor system. 3. Matt denies connection to Fez in 2012. The Polytron documents seem to go against this.